Hello, everyone. And um, I, first of all, I'd like to thank Chris and Steve for inviting me uh, to give a talk. Um, this is a change of focus from the Amazon, and it's really a pitch for uh, doing LIDAR in Africa. Although at this point, after listening to a series of talks, I don't think that there needs to be um, any uh, great discussion about why to do this. There's been a lot of people who have discussed Africa um, in, their, in their talks. So why do we need a digital record of the Earth's landscape in Africa? Well, first of all, Africa has an extraordinary richness in biodiversity and is the last place on Earth with a significant assemblage of large mammals. Major um, landscape changes are underway, however, in this part of the world. Here's a nice satellite view of um, Africa. And today, Africa has the advantage of low ecological and carbon footprints compared with other parts of the world. But immense changes, as I've just said, are underway. The people of Africa cannot lose both the rich natural resources and the indigenous and local knowledge to manage these resources. But it's facing challenges associated with balancing economic growth, uh, rising population and population densities. So here's a map of the subregions of Africa. And um, it's interesting that in the center, in the Congo Basin, basically, are the tropical and subtropical dry and humid forests, but they make up only about 23% of Africa's land areas. 27% um, of Africa is arable, but about only about one-fifth is currently under cultivation. And all of the material in the light green, and of course, the very light yellow, is the arid lands, the grasslands, and the savannas, which makes up about 50% um, of the continent. Uh, so a huge portion is in savannas and grasslands. Um, so ecosystem services, and these are just some of the services that Africa provides to, um, for two people. And I want to point out, uh, this is, uh, again, something from the uh, in, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, but in all areas, carbon sequestration is really one of the prominent con contributions that Africa can provide to people, as well as fisheries um, and uh, things like soil erosion and some coastal issues like um, mangrove swamps and places like that. But the true value of biodiversity and nature's contributions to human well-being tend to be underappreciated in decision-making processes in Africa. There are only a few existing studies on the valuation of um, biodiversity and nature's contributions to people in Africa, both in limited and geographical scope. So failure, failure to reflect values and decision-making often results in unsustainable use and depletion of biodiversity and these ecosystem services. The other thing that I want to point out, even though I'm not an archeologist, is that Africa is arguably the origin of humankind. There are thousands of archeological sites all over Africa, but particularly up and down uh, East Africa, um, all the way from Sudan, all the way down to, to South Africa. And I'm just pointing out one, Olduvai Gorge, where I've spent some time. Um, and it is, home to the oldest fossils belonging to humans um, and that it suggests that it's the home to the very first humans and very likely the location from which we developed all kinds of our abilities. 
uh, today. And um, so this Africa is very, very important in terms of the archaeology of human evolution. But there's a lot of Africa that is under threat, in particular the biodiversity. The number of flora and fauna are threatened by a range of human-induced drivers. And these drivers uh, enhance the loss of productivity, threatening food, water, energy, and health security with negative impacts on livelihoods. Um, drivers such as climate change, habitat conversion, poaching, illegal wildlife trade, pollution, invasive species, all of these things, in addition to things like disease and diseases and pests, um, threaten the biodiversity of Africa. And one of the things that is very uh, prominent in terms of uh, the effects of these drivers is land fragmentation. And this is in part due to agriculture, urbanization, and climate change. So this photo uh, actually shows fence lines and some agriculture and some greenhouses right at the edge of Nairobi National Park in Kenya, which is fragmenting the landscape and has pr primarily halted the wildebeest migration that is in part, that was in part uh, existed in that part of uh, Kenya. So as a, as a result, we have increasing wildlife, uh, livestock, and human conflict. In the photo on the left, we have cattle uh, grazing with wildebeest, which is right at the edge of the city of Nairobi, Kenya. And um, on the right, we have cattle moving with um, uh, giraffes. But unregulated land cover change is detrimental to biodiversity. And it's also detrimental to Africa's long-term social and ecological sustainability. The unregulated conversion of forests and rangelands and other natural areas such as wetlands for food production and urban development is happening at a fast pace following the rapid transformation of African societies. The conversion leads to habitat loss and fragmentation, degradation of water catchment, soil erosion, again, leading to biodiversity uh, loss. Africa is home to many extensive, uh, many subsistence farmers, uh, small-scale livestock herders and pastoralists who maintain a range of plant and animal genetic resources. Um, but agricultural expansion is the dominant driver of biodiversity loss, in particular, the conversion of natural habitat to cultivated land. Uh, some 20% of Africa's land surface is estimated to be degraded because of soil erosion, pollution, and loss of vegetation. The other thing that is really ha happening at a great pace in Africa is urbanization. Urban areas are growing faster than anywhere else in the world. Small urban areas, as well as very large uh, metropolitan areas, the likely doubling of Africa's population by 2050, coupled with rapid, rapid urbanization, will place tremendous additional pressure on the continent's biodiversity and nature's contributions to people. And of course, there's technology and innovation that's also occurring at a very rapid pace. And then there's climate change. Uh, climate variability and extreme events such as droughts and floods have increased in, rest in recent decades as temperatures have increased and seasons have changed. The dry land area of the globe is actually expected to increase to perhaps more than 50% of the global land surface by the end of the 21st century. Arid grasslands are already expanding globally and will be severely impacted by climate change. In East Africa in particular, simulation models suggest increased short season rains by 2050 and more flooding and locust infestations. Um, so 
Indigenous peoples are absolutely key to sustainability. Indigenous and local knowledge on ecosystems and traditional institutions in Africa underpins the way nature benefits people. It's the forefront at, of biodiversity conservation and is critical to the African vision for a good quality of life. Um, so partnering with indigenous peoples as well as government, NGOs and academia are absolutely essential for um, mapping the continent. And here's a figure that shows um, indigenous peoples on a global basis that have tenure rights around the world or use rights. Um, and you can see the very purple places in Africa that make up a very large part um, of, the, of the land area. So 25% of the world's land surface that intersects with 40% of all land-based protected areas are um, managed by indigenous peoples. So it's very important that we all partner with um, these folks. So some of the scientific questions that may emerge from uh, uh, what is the current state in Africa as well as sort of the future um, are the following. Of course, we need a baseline for landscape change. Of course, LIDAR um, can do that. Also detect fragmentation, aggregation of landscape for biodiversity. There are places in Africa that are aggregating landscapes, primarily through community-based uh, cons conservation that's aggregating landscapes for wildlife and uh, people. We need numbers uh, and migration patterns of both wildlife and humans, both for to maintain that uh, wildlife numbers. And of course, pastoralists in Africa move on a regular basis, but there's other types of migration where people are moving across countries as well. Uh, we can detect, we need to detect areas of significance for human evolution. A lot of work's been done but obviously, as Chris and Steve's work has shown us, there's a lot of uh, potential for more work. I mean, more sites to be um, found. We need to conserve landscapes for carbon sequestration. This is really important for the uh, rangelands and savannas for Africa. There's work ongoing about uh, on uh, carbon sequestration for carbon credits in various parts of Africa. And this will actually really help some of the poorest of the poor if um, that carbon sequ sequestration can be increased in some places. We need land use planning for urban areas and conservation areas and understanding finally the importance of water towers uh, for climate and precipitation changes. So um, as my good friend Oli Tamoy, who is a uh, local leader, he has a great quote and he says, there's always a saying where there's a will, there's a way. And if people can go to the moon and come back, I think even land can be managed. This is the only planet we have. We need to be very careful with it. I agree, and thank you all. Thank you very much, Kathy, and I love that quote at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I, uh, we'll go now to Andre for the second presentation in this series. Andre, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Hope you all can hear me well. I want to, first of all, uh, thank again, Chris and Steve for the invite uh, to talk here today. We are going to go back to Amazonia now uh, from Africa. And also we are going to scale down a little bit from all the LIDAR images that we saw today and, and yesterday. And we are gonna talk about soils, the, the skin of the earth. And more specifically, we are gonna talk about the biodiversity of organisms that live below ground under our feet and that sometimes we don't realize how many they are and how important they are for many of the ecosystem service that we all depend upon. 
So this is still a poorly understood dimension of biodiversity. And I would say that that's especially true for tropical ecosystems such as Amazonia. And my hope is to show you that we cannot understand the functioning of these ecosystems and their response to disturbance such as climate change and land use change without knowing um, their soil biodiversity in all their aspects. So this, despite the importance of soil biodiversity uh, and the fact that one quarter of all the biodiversity described on Earth um, lives on soils, we are only starting to know these species better now and their functions in ecosystems. So I love this uh, graph here that was published in the, in the Washington Post some years ago. And you can see here that when I'm talking about soil biodiversity, this includes all sorts of, of invertebrates uh, from earthworms and ants and termites, all the way to the tiny ones like microarthropods, um, like mites, and nematodes, which are the most abundant ones. And also microbes, uh, bacteria and fungi, who are so important for many of the processes involved in nitrogen cycling and carbon cycling ecosystems. So they are, they are very important. They represent a big fraction of the biodiversity that we know on Earth. But actually, about 90% of all the species living in soil are still estimated to remain undescribed. So we don't know them. We don't know who lives in the soil um, in a more general context. If you, so this, I like this graph because you see here the above ground, some above ground species. And the little graphs here, the green area re represents the fraction of the species that we know and the gray area, the fraction that is, is estimated that we don't know yet. And if you go below ground, you see that the gray area of the graphs are much larger uh, than, the, than the green area for all these different groups here. So um, we do have still a huge knowledge gap in terms of uh, knowing who lives below ground, all these species and what they do, which is, is most important. So. The available data on soil biodiversity and the functional relevance is also heavily imbalanced towards temperate environments. And although it has been demonstrated that those organisms are key for ecosystem resilience and resistance to, to disturbance in tropical biomes, we still don't know them very well. Uh, two examples that I really like uh, about uh, the importance of these organisms are these two studies published in Science one from 2015 and one from 2019. And both of them show that soil termites, and those are not the termites that we, you fear are gonna eat your wood house. Those are soil termites. So those studies show that those animals, they help tropical uh, savannas in the case of the 2015 studies, and also rainforests in the case of the 2019 study uh, to resist against climate change. So on both studies, uh, it was shown that uh, landscapes with more uh, termite, bigger termite populations, and also more termite mounds, they are more resistant against the effects of drought. And that's because these animals, their activity in the soil changes the structure of the soil aggregates in a way that enhance the maintenance of soil moisture. So environments with more of these animals and more active animals are in general more resistant to the effects of drought, which are becoming more frequent, frequent and also more severe uh, with, with global warming. However, uh, this biodiversity, this soil biodiversity uh, itself is threatened by human disturbance such as climate change and, and, and land use change. So this was a map uh, published uh, in the Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas, which was published some years ago. And this shows uh, the threats to soil biodiversity, the potential threats to soil biodiversity. Um, in this map, you can see across the so-called arc of deforestation here in Amazonia, uh, that these threats are from high to very high levels. So those are areas where pastures and aggie fields expand over forests. 
and the trash to solve biodiversity are mainly from these deforestation and land use change. Land use change is, is a huge factor uh, affecting biodiversity in general, not, not, not only soil biodiversity. And I know that uh, some other people are going to talk today more deeply about soil about land use change in the Amazon. I saw that Tasso Azevedo is gonna, is gonna talk today about this topic. But you, as you can see here, we live now in a time where intense aggy and urban areas by much surpass areas where natural ecosystem is still uh, exists. And now, although in Amazonia, we still have, at least in Brazil, about 80%, 85% of the, of the uh, primary forest are standing, the ecosystem is being deeply altered by uh, land use change and deforestation in, in, the, in the recent years. So for example, here, this is a very nice and illustrative time-lapse from satellite images published, uh, published by the New York Times uh, a couple of years ago. And this is for an area in the Bolivian Amazonia. As you can see, it wasn't very long ago when most of the land was pristine rainforest. But now about 30 years, 30, 35 years later, uh, the situation is completely different. And this is true for vast areas, for example, in Brazil, in Eastern Amazon, Amazonia, and also in the Southern uh, part of Amazonia in Brazil, where agricultural fields have really expanded uh, over uh, forest areas. In terms of uh, soil biodiversity, we, don't know, we still don't know much uh, of how these chains in Amazonia affect them. Despite the importance of soil to, to life below ground and all the ecosystem service, in Amazonia, it wasn't until 2002 that a major global research initiative funded by UNEP, the UN Environment Program, and executed by the Tropical Soil Biology and Fertility Institute, the TSBF, uh, addressed the state of the biome soil biodiversity. So this is a book that was a product of that project. So it, it integrates all the data that came out of that project. And this project and some more recent ones uh, offer an opportunity for data integration and for data synthesis that may help us to understand how soil biodiversity has been affected by all the changes in land use happening in Amazonia. So inspired by that, in 2018, uh, myself and some colleagues here at Colorado State University and also colleagues in Brazil, we decided to try a data integration and synthesis of all published studies that we could found on the response of Amazonian soil biodiversity to deforestation and land use change. So at the end, we analyzed 274 pairwise comp uh, comparisons of soil biodiversity in Amazonian primary forests, and also sites under different stages of deforestation and, and land use conversion. So we had disturbed, uh, forests, those that have been affected by wildfire and selective logging, and also uh, completely deforested areas, pasture areas, and cropping systems. So we find these studies in the literature, and we extracted the data, and we did a meta-analysis to understand what's the general pattern of response of soil, soil biodiversity to deforestation and land use change. So this first, so the, I have only, I promised you have only two uh, data slides. So in this one, uh, the response variable here is the response ratio. So it's the biodiversity before deforestation minus uh, the biodiversity level after deforestation and negative values means negative response of soil biodiversity to uh, deforestation. And we could find that for soil invertebrates, larger losses of biodiversity of these groups occurred in wetter sites, uh, meaning those sites with mean annual precipitation higher than 1900 millimeters. And also um, higher losses happen, happen in areas where deforestation happened 30 years or more uh, before the study uh, that quantified these losses. So, we identified that for soil invertebrates, these two factors, the mean annual precipitation of an area and also the time since deforestation 
were the main uh, drivers of soil biodiversity response to deforestation. In terms of the soil microbes, uh, we found that soil pH was the main environmental control of uh, microbial response to deforestation. As you can see here, uh, most of the, of the studies found negative response of microbial, uh, microbial biodiversity to deforestation. And we saw that larger losses of microbial diversity occurred in highly acidic soils, uh, meaning those with pH lower than 4.5. So as you can think, uh, this data really uh, helps to identify those areas that could be more sensitive. So areas that could be prioritized for conservation in terms of uh, the maintenance of soil biodiversity. And it's also a, a common goal in this type of data integration and data synthesis studies to identify gaps in the literature and point you know, the, the way forward uh, in the research area. So here in this study, we did found uh, many gaps in the literature in, the, in this field. And number one, we found a very limited geographic coverage of soil biodiversity data in Amazonia. So most of the studies that we could found and extract, extracted data with uh, from uh, were from Brazil, especially here from the, the, forest, the arch of the deforestation area. Only a couple of studies came from Col Southern Colombia. There were also some studies from Peru that unfortunately uh, we couldn't use them because they didn't meet the criteria for, for data synthesis. But all the other countries uh, where the Amazonian biome, biome extended, extends, uh, we couldn't find any information regarding soil biodiversity. So there is this lim huge limited geographic coverage. Um, number two, uh, we found an omission of micro and mesofauna. So usually in soil biodiversity research, we categorize the, the groups uh, according to their body size. So macrofauna is earthworms, termites, ants. Uh, mesofauna is columbola, uh, mites, and the microfauna are nematodes. So those micro and meso invertebrates, we couldn't find any information regarding their response to Amazonian deforestation. So do, that's a huge gap in the literature in the field. And finally, we also found a very um, widespread low taxonomic resolution in most of the studies, meaning that we cannot say much at this point about how species or, or genera uh, respond to deforestation. All these studies, uh, in all these studies, the, the animals work were identified in very broad uh, taxonomic groups. So that represents a huge gap in terms of, you know, understanding the ecology of um, species of soil biodiversity in Amazonia. So that's all the data that I plan to show today in hopes to bring soil biodiversity a bit uh, into the spotlight here. But I also want to mention about a pilot uh, boots on the ground study that we started largely encouraged by this previous uh, data synthesis effort that we um, employed. So we started a pilot study on the functional diversity of soil microbial genes in Amazonian land uses. And for that, we traveled to this place called, the city called Paragominas in the state of Pará, uh, Brazil, that's Eastern Amazonia. Uh, if you go to Google and make a, a quick Google search about this city, you will find think some very interesting aspects about it. First is the, the very large territory uh, of the municipal, of the city. It's larger than the state of New Jersey, uh, for example. Also, this city became a model uh, for sustainable development in, in, the, in Amazonia after they managed to stop deforestation in their land and they intensified production in the open areas to um, counter for not open new, air, new areas anymore. So this city was once ranked a first in the what they call the dark rank of, of deforestation in Brazil. And in two years from 2010 to 2012, they managed to completely stop deforestation in their land and really became this model for sustainable develop, development. So this is a satellite view of the farm where we are doing, we are performing this study. 
Uh, the farm is very uh, conveniently neighboring the, the city, but also the university, which is the Universidade Federal Rural uh, da Amazônia. And also there is an Embrapa field support office just by uh, the farm over here. So in this area, we located uh, fields with different land use, but that would be in the same uh, soil type. So you can see here, for example, that in this sandy soil over here, you have um, uh, a forest. It's, it's, it's far from being a primary precinct forest, but you still have these well-managed uh, forests here, and also uh, areas with soybean and also a pasture area. In the same situation here in a clay soil uh, basis. So we couldn't explore the, the environmental gradients that the data synthesis study revealed to be important, but we could uh, study here with, you know, in local, the effects of land use change on Amazonian soil biodiversity. This is an example here of one of these areas. You have the forest neighboring the pasture and the soil being filled. Uh, this is just you, uh, you know a picture of this of the soils and showing here that in terms of soil texture there was very little variability in term, uh, between the land the different land use areas uh, for each of these situations and that's uh, what we really want to avoid uh, to sample uh, to survey the the soil biodiversity we use this scheme we had three transects in each of these land use, in each transect, we, we collect five sampling points. Uh, we brought, as I said, you, you, is, we are checking the skin of the earth. So this is really collecting soil from zero to 20 centimeters and extracting the DNA and, and exploring which animals live there, which genes are abundant and what that means for process like nitrogen cycling, carbon cycling. This can really give us insights in terms of the ability of these ecosystems to, sequ uh, to sequester carbon and to mineralize nitrogen, which is vital for plant growth. So this is a view with the, with the sampling points in, uh, from one of the areas. And what I really want to emphasize here is the collaboration with local students uh, from, the, from the university in Paragominas. This was just a, a wonderful opportunity to uh, bring um, CSU expertise there, but more than that, to learn from, uh, from the students who live there, who have the local knowledge. Many of these students are from indigenous families, so they have um, the, the traditional knowledge to share with us. So it was just an amazing experience to be in the field for several days uh, with local uh, students from the university there. And... We still keep collaborating and we hope that this pilot study will become a bigger project in, in the future. That's again, a picture of the local students that work with us there. So we had many local partners uh, where we um, brought the soil samples for analysis for uh, the characterization of the soil physical and chemical aspects uh, and also for the DNA analysis. Here we are at the ITV, which is a lab uh, that belongs to Valley. Uh, and here is the, the main PI of the, of the lab there, Guilherme, Guilherme Oliveira. And here is Bruno Sobral and Diana Wall from CSU and Zaid Abdo, who are all very important components of the, of the study there. So this is still a work in progress. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of data to share from this yet. You can see here all the mess that we are in right now. Um, analyzing this data and try to understand what's going on. Uh, we hope that at the end, um, the information that we are going to get will allow uh, soil biodiversity to be considered when we when assessing the impact of Amazonian land use change and deforestation on the ecology of the, that biome, um, and also how important those animals are for the restoration process in many areas that are already degraded. So our future goal is to study how land use driven change in soil biodiversity affect ecosystem functions such as carbon cycling, nitrogen cycling, and processes in, in Amazonia. So with that, I want to thank all the partners that we, we have for this study, which are many uh, universities in Brazil, Embrapa, Valley, and also here at CSU, the School of Global Environmental Sustainability, 
the One Health Institute and the Vice Presidents for Research, which funded the pilot study. I uh, thank you all for your attention. Here is my email address, uh, my Twitter account, and please feel free to contact me uh, if you have any, any follow-up to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, so we're now gonna welcome Michael Barton to give his, to give his presentation on the subject. Hi. Um, so I said, I'm Michael Barton. I'm a professor in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change and the School of Complex Adaptive Systems uh, here at ASU. I also direct um, uh, a scientific network, uh, an online archive called CompsisNet. Um, my background is in social and natural sciences together, um, anthropology and geosciences. I do geoarchaeology, but my interests are on these long-term uh, interaction dynamics of coupled uh, human and earth systems. And so I'm going to give you some examples, short vignettes, to kind of illustrate the value, the importance of uh, transparent science and, and big data and how uh, scientists can share their data to actually better understand um, uh, long-term change in socio-ecological systems. And of course, uh, sharing data and large data is, it underlies the, the ethic of the Earth Archive. <clears throat> so I wanna start out by simply mentioning briefly CompsisNet, which is uh, uh, a scientific community uh, like the, the idea that uh, Earth, Earth Archive is trying to develop. Um, it works to uh, try and support uh, open scientific computation and the exchange of knowledge among uh, specialists and practitioners and stakeholders. Uh, as a scientific network, uh, CompsisNet has um, uh, nearly 3,000 members. Um, Kathy was one of the founding members of CompsisNet and helped get it started and has been active in the network uh, for many years. Uh, we have education training programs, uh, but especially we have a science gateway uh, for network and sharing knowledge um, even with the pandemic, we had almost 60,000 individual sessions uh, to the Gateway unique sessions last year. And the Gateway supports an open access archive. Again, this is what uh, Earth Archive is trying to develop, an archive of model code uh, contributed by the scientific community. Almost 900 models are available for socio and ecological system science or freely free to download. And last year, um, we had almost 40,000 downloads of code. Uh, so um, I just want to mention that as, as, an, as one example of uh, open science for social and ecological systems. And I'm going to switch and put on my geoarchaeology hat here and talk about long-term dynamics of socio-ecological systems <coughs> um, uh, in the past. Uh, and, and uh, you know, archaeology, um, which I've done for a long time, it's, it's popularly seen as the study of the past. And actually, even a lot of archaeologists think about it as the study of the past. And so... Um, how is this relevant to the kind of challenges we face today, like deforestation in the Amazon, uh, changes in Africa, and uh, uh, other kinds of changes? Well, we can rethink of archaeology instead of just the study of the past as a science of long-term socio-ecological dynamics. Um, and, and, in order to, and, and this, we can use archaeological data, and is, the archaeological record is a unique and really powerful database for building and testing models of these long-term social processes that are relevant today. And this can help us understand how the world that we live in now actually came to be, uh, but also what the future might hold for that world. Um, but archeology span has a data problem. Um, and uh, even though there's lots of data, we have a data problem. And, and one is that you know, we study uh, the archeological record and that's artifacts and you know, ruins and, and other, other kinds of things that are found in the ground right on the surface with the goal of trying to reconstruct ancient socio and ecological systems. So we want to understand the dynamics of these ancient systems, you know, how they evolved, how they changed, you know, what, what happened. But what we really find is just their trash. That's what archeological record is. And most of it is not preserved for us to find. Furthermore, of the fraction of the archeological record, this trash that's actually preserved and accessible we only can really recover a tiny, tiny, tiny little part represented in the landscape here. Um, and finally, you know, the popular view of archeologists is one of this lone researcher or adventurer, you know, who finds a key artifact and reads it to decipher the past, right? But 
if we want to understand socioecological systems, those dynamics takes place at regional and with telecoupled uh, processes today, even global scales. You know, so how can a few pieces of old trash found by an archaeologist in one little part of the landscape, right, tell us something about the, the large scale dynamics at regional or even larger scales of socioecological systems, much less the future of these systems? Well, the truth is, you know, alone, even someone like Indiana Jones could really contribute little to this uh, understanding, little more than entertainment. However, fortunately, archaeology can actually meet the challenge of this data problem by sharing knowledge and sharing data from the thousands of archaeologists, from tens of thousands of locations around the world, and millions of artifacts that are recovered. If we can, if we can pool this knowledge, the record is extraordinarily rich, and we can learn a lot about the long-term dynamics of these systems. So what I want to do is give a few brief examples of these kinds of studies, studies that would be impossible without this kind of open, transparent, uh, and science. I'll start with a long time ago, um, before farming, before cities, everybody was a hunter-gatherer, right? And this is a study that colleagues and I have been working on for a while. It's a, trying to understand the biological and cultural consequences of climate change, land use change, and mobility uh, in the ancient occupants of Europe. And we use data from many, many different studies from over a century of, of Pleistocene archaeology, that study of archaeology of the last ice age. Uh, and we've found out ways of reanalyzing published information about stone artifacts, which are the most common kind of artifacts, as an indicator of ancient mobility and land use practices. And when I'm talking about land use, you know, there's a spectrum of ways in which hunter-gatherers use the land to interact with their environment. And, and at one end, right, um, hunter-gatherers move, move their camps from place to place around the landscape to find different kinds of resources as they become available. Uh, this is sometimes called residential mobility or land use strategies, and it's common mostly at lower latitudes due to the way plants and animals are distributed uh, at lower latitudes. At the other end, other end of the spectrum, this continuum, uh, are called logistical land use strategies, where there's a central camp where everybody stays for a long period of time, but they send out foraging parties to different places to get resources and bring them back. And this is more common due to, due to the distribution of plants and animals at high latitudes, right? So um, we compiled information from um, uh, over nearly 200,000 artifacts from and nearly 200 archeological assemblages from uh, sites across Western Eurasia and used this to study land use strategies and how they changed uh, in response to or adapting to climate change uh, in, in Eurasia from the last interglacial, like we have now in the Holocene, to the last glacial maximum. This was a really important time of change in climate, in human biology, and in human culture. And so here's a graph that shows changing climate over this period. Uh, and this information comes from a, a core dug into the glaciers in Antarctica at Vostok Station. And, and what we can see here is that the last interglacial, this is warm up here, it's warmer. And over time, this is, this is a proxy for global temperatures. It gets colder and colder until we get the maximum of the last ice age, the last glacial maximum. So this is period of climate change and there's variations within this, of course. So how did people respond to this? We've divided it into four time periods for analysis. Okay, so if we look at the, the same period of climate change in these four periods, um, what we can see is that there's this shift toward colder temperatures, toward more Arctic-like environments in Europe, like in high latitudes. So how did people respond? Well, what they did was there's this shift from uh, more diverse kinds of land use practices toward what we see here. This is a logistical mobility. So there's a real focus on this new kinds of mobility uh, in Europe as people adapted successfully to, this cl to climate change. But this shift to logistical land use had consequences, biological and cultural consequences. In moving over longer distances to go out foraging, people could interact, had more opportunities to interact with more individuals at greater distances. And um, we use this information, this knowledge, as a basis for simulation modeling, computer simulation modeling, of what the results would be if this happens. And what we found is that um, when people adapted, when these Eurasian hunter-gatherers, Neanderthals we call them, 
uh, adapted successfully to environmental change, this, uh, this interaction with more people also led to um, them merging with other human populations in the world and disappearing, coming extinct as a biologically and culturally distinct population. And, and here's an example, here's a result of some of the simulation modeling. And we start out with populations, these are people outside of Europe, and these are Eurasian populations, a, a local population. And over time, when you increase the amount of interaction, uh, what happens is the, the Neanderthal populations disappear and then becomes dominated by Eurasian populations that have some Neanderthal genes, but not a distinct different group, right? So let's move up to more recent times. And this is what's going on at the end of the Pleistocene, end of the Ice Age. And this was a different study of environmental risk, uh, resilience uh, across uh, a shorter time period, a mere 16,000 years from the last glacial maximum where the last study ended up to the beginning of the current interglacial. And we looked at even a larger sample of archeological data for this, again, gathered from the shared published data of many other studies. Um, almost half a million artifacts, over half a million artifacts, 300,000 animal bones, looked at paleoclimate models, and then a lot of radiocarbon dates, which we can use to kind of give us a, a, an estimate proxy for population, for demography. Here's, and we focused on the West Mediterranean for this to understand how people adapted to increasing risk and uncertainty at this time period, at the end of the last glaciation, a period of global warming. Right? And so here's all the archeological sites uh, that we looked at. And this is uh, from climate modeling. These are some graphs that show in different areas um, changes in precipitation and in temperature uh, and also the variance, right? So the unpredictability of this. And we find that going from the last glacial maximum to the end of the Pleistocene, uh, environment and climate gets more and more unpredictable and risky until we get to the current interglacial where then it calms down again. So how do people deal with this? Well, <clears throat> they shifted their food gathering patterns, their hunting patterns. In the last glacial maximum, people focused mostly on large game, uh, but as time went by, right, they continued hunting some large game, but they focused more and more on small game, right? So they ended up with a bifurcated pattern of two kinds of, of hunting strategies. Land use strategies, there were more base camps and, and, and close in uh, forager camps, but in adapting to periods of higher, higher risk, right, we see more and more of these very short-term foraging camps that collect resources at greater distance. But then when we get to the current interglacial, it goes back to looking like it did in the last uh, glacial maximum. Uh, so by the time we get to the Holocene, we've ended up with a very different pattern than we started out with uh, uh, 16,000 years earlier. And finally, looking at population over this time period, these different kinds of adaptations were highly successful. This is estimated population within a kind of a normal uh, model here. And so population does not change very much. It's pretty stable throughout this period of all this environmental change, right? Until we get to the end where risk and uncertainty in climate gets, gets really great. And initially people did very well and population even climbed, but then it collapsed and we have demographic collapse and it does not return to a stable population until we get to the current interglacial. So um, you can see that people had flexible subsistence and land use strategies that let them be successful over many, many thousands of years of environmental change. The kind of social and technological uh, innovations that they did to have these strategies to be resilient <clears throat> even enabled rapid population growth. But eventually environmental risk and uncertainty exceeded these limits and, and, um, and people were unable to uh, maintain a successful way of life. Uh, population collapsed, and we ended up with a very different kind of socio-ecological system uh, afterwards in the Holocene. And, and so, you know, in fact, we could even ask, did the, did the success early on make these societies more vulnerable to the more extreme climate fluctuations at the end of the Pleistocene? Things that we're facing today and in the future. <clears throat> the final example is even more more recent in time, we'll move up to the current interglacial, the Holocene. Um, different colleagues and I have developed computer simulation models to test ideas 
about how farming spread across the West Mediterranean. So how does farming get started and how did it spread? And we're looking at a number of questions that are relevant to smallholder farming today. So uh, including spread of farming into Amazonia, for example, in different parts of Africa. So how did farming practices actually arrive in, 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 the, in the West Mediterranean, in the Iberian Peninsula, right? And once it was there, <clears throat> how did it spread? Did farmers clear land just next to ex uh, existing fields, new land, you know, kind of spread smoothly? Or did they leapfrog and pioneer into new areas farther away? Did they clear any land that was reasonably good for farming or did they only go after the really the best land and, and leave gaps in, in, in the landscape? And then finally, how much did they mind the presence of other people, higher population densities when they started farming? So we, we came up with computer models that could simulate farming spread in different ways to answer these research questions and then compared the model output to a bunch of archeological sites where we have dates of when farming started in the West Mediterranean. <clears throat> um, we uh, uh, looked, looked at the time, the different experiments, the modeling experiments arrived at the dated archeological sites. And we had modeling experiments that took into account differences in the potential suitability of land for wheat farming, um, where different places where the where farming could have started in the Iberian Peninsula, um, <clears throat> whether it expanded continuously from a, a, some point or did it jump into a bunch of different spots at, at a great distance? And then how important were, were was population density and having neighbors? Um, and uh, we looked to find the experiments that were the best match for the dated archeological sites, this large collection of archeological data that we used. And of course, what we found is the best match is it our, that farming came into the peninsula from three different areas almost simultaneously. Uh, people pioneered new land rather than spread continuously out from uh, where they were, were farming. They preferred the best land. They would skip to the best land and skip over land that was not quite so good. And they moderately tried to avoid higher population densities. Um, None of these studies would have been possible for any individual, myself or anybody else, to carry out. Um, and it wasn't, wouldn't have been possible for any individual archaeological project to, to uh, be applied to understand these long-term regional scale socio-ecological dynamics. These require knowledge sharing and access to the results of many, many, many projects put together, combined together, which again is the, the idea behind the Earth Archive. And I say that, to be fair, um, my colleagues and I have tried to follow suit and make all of the results of our research openly available to others. You can download the data, uh, the, the scripts we use to analyze the data, and even the models uh, at very, where we publish these online. So I want to close by talking about open science. Uh, there's the um, uh, open science interest group that was formed a few years ago, just a few years ago, in the Society for American Archaeology. That's the flagship um, organization for archaeologists in the Western Hemisphere, and uh, recognizing that shared knowledge is needed for archaeology to actually make a substantial, meaningful contribution to challenges we face in today's world. And uh, there's growing support for this in, in archaeology. Uh, the Open Science and Archaeology uh, Initiative um, wants to try and advance openness in the way archaeologists uh, handle data and their methods and their research outputs and, um, um, and advocates for open reproducible archaeological research and increased visibility uh, in what they're doing. So um, uh, these are the same goals that really should underlie the Earth, Science, uh, the Earth Archive initiative. And I want to end by uh, thanking everybody and the, the many, many people and the many groups who have worked together to make these uh, research projects possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. That was a very interesting presentation. I definitely learned something from all three of the presentations today. And there's time for one question, which is in the Q&A. And this question is um, directed at Kathy, I believe. And I'm also really interested in it. The question is, is there a map of the usurpations of indigenous territory and today? How indigenous people lose, have lost or lose their ancestral rights currently through non-recognition of true history? Kathy, do you have any idea about that? So I actually don't know if there, especially 
for Africa or even the globe. I don't know if there is a map of um, those lands prior to being taken away at time of colonialism or anything else. Do you? Um, I actually don't. I think when I was at the Land Tenure Center a long time ago, I saw something like that for West Africa, but I don't think I've seen anything recently. So that was the only question we had. <laughs> um, so I'd like to thank all of you for your presentations. They're very interesting. And I'd like to remind everyone, if you have a chance, um, feel free to go into the networking lounges and talk with each other about some of these things or others and visit some of the sponsors lounges also if you're interested in any of the technologies that have been shared. And with that, we're gonna close down this track for an hour until the next session of this track, which will be on map biomass and the land use changes in the Amazon over the last 30 years. And we can all go back to track one where Mark Plotkin is talking on what everyone needs to know about the Amazon. So thanks very much. Oh, and yeah, all thanks. these will, were recorded and they will be online at some point in time in the near future if you want to watch them again which i probably will thanks thanks everyone thank you, thank you very much